government is slow. Yeah, yeah. Government yeah. slow. That's why private sector takes takes up opportunities a little bit better. That's why there's such a huge push for privatization. We need everyone in government. Like, like what I have enjoyed is that the the conversation around the government of national unity has suddenly started to sprout up. We need everyone. We do need the DA. We do need the EFF. We do need MK. We do need the ANC. Because remember, there's a lot of people who might have voted for the ANC who don't agree with the DA. Mm-hmm. But they have no say in whether or not the ANC and the DA um, coalesce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey family, a quick one. Over 87% of you are consuming this content every single week but are not subscribed. That means you are enjoying the growth conversations but you are not liking, you are not subscribing and you are not sharing it with others. So please, I plead with you, please subscribe so that you can share the love, you can share the growth and you can share this wonderful platform and wonderful safe space with others as well. Enjoy the episode. This week I went to go renew my passport, sure. right? So I finished my first passport, mm-hmm. well, my second passport. Not many and, can say that. <laughs> yes, and many people don't even know this. So I want a jumbo passport. Uh-huh. I have to pay my passport with my US visa and all the other visas I've had. It's not finished. It's not six months to go. So now I have to pay for this because it's not finished and then pay for the jumbo, the new one. But actually, in actual fact, even a passport... Is 32 pages, but six of those pages are unusable. So you're using like 26 pages. So it's like there's so many weird things around controlling people's movements. Sure. And maybe even controlling their minds around movements that exist yeah, in, yeah, in the yeah, world, yeah. and yeah. particularly in South Africa. That just, it just stresses me out. So Julius Malema, is that you? You no. want to you, you wanna go to Lusaka? No. You want to wake up and go to Lusaka? I, I, you want to wake up and go to Nairobi? Yeah, you could. Look, I... I don't want to label it. I don't want to label it as a Julius Malema thing. I think we should all be open-minded. Sure. Because at the same time, I'm also anti what he kind of talks about, in the, in the sense of open borders. Everything else, I can debate it. I like the policy around. Uh, I like the EFA policy around a sovereign wealth fund. In fact, I did a video on this and said, sure. how could we do it together with mm-hmm. the private sector? Right. Mm-hmm. I had that conversation, and then even when you look at. Um, even when you look at policies around sort of like a black bank, I kind of get that. But at the same time, we've got to figure out a systematic way of doing it with what we already have. I think times South Africans need to understand the frameworks that we work in and say, what are the real challenges in those frameworks rather than saying, let's start a whole thing. And like, we've got to have that discussion with ourselves. We've got a lot of state banking entities that need to be rolled into one thing. Okay. We've got to question ourselves and say, do we want to make it one thing or do we want to have multiple things that serve different types of people across the country? Because you've got an Itala, you've got a post bank, you've got a lot of those, but you've also got massive funding institutions that can be rolled into the same banking entity, right? You've got the NEF, you've got CIFA, you've got CEDA, you've got IDC, right? You've got Land Bank. You got uh, the Development Bank of South sure, Africa. Sure. So all of these things, think about it. If you put them all into one space and you said, this same bank that does day-to-day trading, retail trading, what if we actually make it, the lending part of it is all of our lending institutions in South Africa, the government-owned lending institutions, and we put them into this bank, and that portion of it is still the same portion that gives grants, that gives loans, and that also gives credit. So there's a different way of kind of getting to the same goal. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck up in saying, because I support a particular party, there's only this party's way of doing something, right? And, that's, and that, I, I think, is always a stumbling block. What I'm getting from your explanation is that maybe using the word nationalizing is, is reductionist. 
right? In the sense that it sounds like you go to APSA, FNB, say, bring me your bank, I'm taking it back. Yes. When in fact, you're saying there are vehicles that exist, yes. which are banks, yes. that have state ownership in there, regardless yes. of what percentage of state, state yes. ownership. But you can take those vehicles and consolidate them 100%. to fulfill all these mandates. 100%. And that is nationalization. Yes. And also, you've got to also understand that the... the <laughs> Government and the private sector are terrible allocators of capital. Okay. And what I mean by this is that they've got so much bureaucracy and red tape that it gets in the way of them making simple decisions. And because of those simple decisions not being able to be made in a timeliest manner, money is lost. Time is money. So let me give you a perfect example. Capital Bank, by its very nature and existence, started out as a lending institution, microloans lending institution. A banking license came up, they bought the banking license, and they've grown the bank in maybe less than 20 years to what it is today, sure. a contender. Now, how did they do, do that? It was quite simple. They were professional in how they did things, but they also made it cheap for black South Africans to get onto their banking platform. Okay. That, that, that was the simple thing, right? Then they also marketed the hell out of themselves. So... We can start a state institution relative to how I've spoken about it, where we put a lot of the things that we have, which are technically banking and finance institutions already, into one space and then say to you, you can bank with the gov, but it's actually government owns a portion of it, but it's actually privately run. Sure. Right? We've got really good financial, I'd say, institutions in South Africa when it comes to things like Treasury, PIC, SARS, etc. Entities that handle money. And they work. They work. Yeah. So I don't see it being such a crazy stone's throw to say we could actually get a, a state-run banking entity that competes fairly in the same market. Because this is not new, right? It's not new. Telcom competes in a private telecoms market. Sure. Right? And it competes and fairly. And it competes fairly. And yeah. it, when it, sometimes it gets clubbed. Sometimes it wins, right? It won when it, it switched over to data. Yeah, it won yeah. quickly because people yeah. were like, oh, they've got the cheapest data rates. And people flocked to it. Sure. But it also messed it up when it was still, uh, was it 8 Ata. mobile? Eight, Ata. Ata. Yes, yes, when it was still yes. Ata. But then it, it kind of figured itself out. So all of these things can be done. But they're a, they're a good participant within the market because they you. keep the market in check. Yeah. Government must be there as a leveler in most markets so that you can see what the players are doing, etc. The SABC is vital in the broadcast market. So what we've got to get right is we've got to run these things properly. That's what we've got to get right. Is that the political will part then to run them properly? I don't even think it's the political will. I think they, there's a few things. So let's say we've got a finite number of people in the country who sure. can do banking. Okay. So when you start to split this thing along various lines... Other people who are used to certain types of revenues, other banking institutions that are used to certain types of revenues, they start to think, hey, if the government's also on board, remember government has got X amount of 100,000 civil servants. Immediately the government can be like, civil servants, better rates at our bank. Suddenly all the civil servants start Move to across. bank there. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why there's a lot of pushback mm -hmm. with, with simple things. That's why there's pushback on NHI. Because government already has... Government is the biggest spender across all sectors mm -hmm. in, our, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you're buying. Government is buying more of it. Correct. So when you as the private sector start to look at this new player, this new entrant, you will do whatever it takes to create a barrier for this new entrant to come in. And remember, government, because of its bureaucracy, I was when Zindu is Lula, simple things, because it's got to go through committees and whatnot, for a good reason to some extent. But for efficiency and effectiveness sake, ah, government is slow. Yeah, yeah. Government yeah. slow. That's why private sector takes, takes up opportunities a little bit better. That's why there's such a huge push for privatization, which I agree to some extent and disagree in some extent, right? Because certain things need to be private to some extent so that you can get outside technical expertise sure. that is not going to be beholden to a uh, governmental bureaucracy, mm -hmm. but you need outside private technical ability to get these things over the line and the ability to reward those who do well, which also looks at the privatization of the state. Because the state, I believe, 
should be paying those people that are doing well in the state more than their salaries, sure. just like what they would if they were working in, in private private's. corporate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you do you do you believe? Um, uh, you briefly mentioned the, the the NHI. Yeah. In the manner that it's currently presented, is it as flawed as what the opposition parties are saying too, and what is private sector screaming that yeah. it's flawed? Or are they going back to pushing back because they realize how much they're going to lose in the process? So, so I always think, I always think to myself, there's a lot of short, short-sightedness when it comes to looking at things. The NHI, in its, in how it stands right now, is not a finished product. product. Yeah. Yes, I agree. It, there was a lot of running and trying to get it over the line before elections, etc. Don't know if that worked. But, um, but at the end of the day... It's something that's needed, maybe not in this current form, maybe in a negotiated form. Correct. But what they've done is that they've, made, they've put the conversation on the table and they've said, we should have this table around how do we universally cover South Africans when it comes healthcare. to health care, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, what this does is that you've got more people that are likely to be able to access private hospitals with at least a buffer of them being able to pay for some of those services, maybe not all of them, when you start to having universal health care. Yeah, yeah. Now, many people will tell you and say, cut before the horse, let's fix the, 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 the health care system. Yeah. And I say to you, why can't we do both at the exact same time? Because there is capacity that exists in the private sector when it comes to private health care. And they will never fill that gap because it's underutilized. It's underutilized. Yeah. So now we're saying, why not start to spread this a little bit more wider? Now, the, immediately, what you start to find, and I had simple conversations with people, is that it's also the black middle class that gatekeeps a lot of the stuff. Sure. Because there is a, there is a, there's a trickle up effect in South Africa when it comes to money. It goes up. It goes from those who are poorest, right, who live hand to mouth, to those with maybe small mom and pop shops, to banking systems, <coughs> to those with really big institutions, yes. all the way up to the top. Now, when you look at something like the the NHI and healthcare, you find that the simple conversations I'm having with somebody who even was a civil servant, I said, "Yo, this N- NHI thing, are you for it?" and she says, no, I'm not, I, I don't see it because now we're going we're gonna to be taxed more, we're going to be what not. I said, but there's literally no framework on how to raise the money yet. How mm. do you know you're mm. going to be taxed more, mm. right? Because you're already paying either GEMS, which is the government-owned one, sure. or you are in uh, like a Paul Med, the police medical one, or you're in some civil servant medical aid scheme, which is heavily subsidized already. So is that not a form of NHI? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, then she mm-hmm. goes, yeah, kind of. But it's like... You actually don't want poorer people to get to so access proper... that level of privilege that yes. like you are getting because you're already let's, subsidized. Let's have that to convers- be in that private let's hospital. Let's have that conversation. Yeah. Let's have it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because when you start to make it universal, it's not to say maybe your entire medical aid is going to go or this tax is going to go fully to that thing. It's also going to cover you. Mm-hmm. That's what people don't get. Like, let's say you do get taxed. It means that to some extent, maybe in the form that they might have it in, is that maybe you walk into a, 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 a private health healthcare facility for a simple procedure. Maybe the procedure is going to cost you a thousand rand just to make it simple. Maybe you're already covered for like 430 rand of that because of NHI. So NHI fits some of the bill, then you put on something on top or your other existing medical aid puts something on top and suddenly that thing you pay maybe 100 rand for that service. Mm-hmm. So these are some of the things that people need to kind of consider. We already have models that do this some of them don't work really well but the intention is good like a ref ref is a public liability uh insurance for anybody who uses roads in south africa Mm -hmm. right it's there it makes sense i don't agree with how lawyers take like 10 to 15 billion rand of ref's entire budget just because they are intermediaries i don't agree with that Mm -hmm. because ref should be able to pay the people directly Directly. right but some of those claims processes make it that you need legal um, legal sort of representation because they're so tedious. Exactly, but yeah. it's it's a similar setup. Mm-hmm. We've it's it's blanketed, so anybody who uses South African roads is covered public liability. So NHI is similar. It doesn't mean it'll cover everything. It just means it'll cover some parts of the medical health sort of needs of people. That's also how I see it. I don't see NHI saying now suddenly you can get any procedure you want from any 
uh, prospective healthcare facility. It does, it's not going to work like that, right? About the NHI, I tweeted, I think it was yesterday, I said this pending ANCDA coalition, which in my yeah. opinion is most likely yeah. nationally, means that any prospects of universal health care is at least 20 years in the back burner now. It's going to be dragged it's, for that's... so long and it will never happen. So well done, black middle class. You are now going to continue paying for medical aid, the 9% annual increase on the medical aid, the gap cover and the co-payment because you are so adamant in saying, what NHI, what NHI? Well done. So, so the interesting thing about that is that I think we've never had, and this is, this is I'm going to put this on our government, we, they don't know how to communicate things. Sure. They, they don't. <clears throat> and I don't know of a bill in recent memory, maybe you can, maybe the guys can put in the comments and let us know, like a bill that has started, had proper public participation in it, gone to, through the phases, gone back to people, had more conversations, so that people understand where we're trying to get to. Sure. It always feels like we, we heard about it, that they want to do this. Then suddenly it's like, then there well, was silence. It's, well, it's at, the, it's at the president's table. Yeah. So it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And they can, within reason, say, no, we gazetted it. No, we, did, we gazetted it. We put a couple of ads out. But we know when governments want wants us to know something, and we know when they something hasn't want. been proper, properly sure. been put in front of our faces. So that's kind of where I, I get to start. I also, I also kind of think when we speak about the, this pending coalition, right? I, I guess at the time we're recording this, we don't yeah, know what's yeah, going to happen, yeah. right? But oof, we, we've got so many, there's so many variables, right? So let's say, let's say, let's talk about the DA thing. Mm -hmm. You talk about just about the NHI. I think about BRICS, right? Immediately. Like, they want us out of there. DA is very West leaning. Sure. Right? They want us out of there. The ANC is very much an East leaning. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, where do, where's the middle ground on that? Where's the middle ground on us being like willing, capable, effective participants of the BRICS block? You understand? So it's, 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 you start to think of really big foreign policies. Where do, we, where do we stand on the Palestine issue? Because if you coalesce, if you go into a coalition together, then it means that you've got to find some sort of middle ground on all issues. But some issues don't need middle ground. It's clear. Palestine is clear, right? BRICS is clear. We're not saying we don't want the West. We're saying we want to be associated with other people. So suddenly you start to find that the levers of government and how government turns, the DA will have a lot more oversight on those. Now the question is, do we want those? Do we think those are progressive enough for the country as black people, as a black majority? Yes, we share the country with everyone, but you then got to start to figure out what are the best policies going forward? Land, right? Land. How do, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. They're going to say, no, but ah, you should, the, the government's the biggest landowner. Yeah, sure, we should. Government should be taken to task for not distributing, TV, distributing land properly <clears throat> enough. But there's a bigger conversation around land that is lying fallow, mm -hmm. right? There's land that is not being used, land that has buildings on them in the inner city that are derelict and are literally breaking down. But because they're owned by somebody, government can't do anything about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The local uh, city can't do anything about it. So we've got to look at these policies and say, when two opposing but mutually beneficial sort of parties. Because remember, these parties are... are, are there, was a, there was a Helen Zillick clip that came out from a long time ago, right? That said, they just want the NC to be hitting low 40s and they'll be fine. Because then with their 20, they get over 60, but then suddenly they have a lot of push and, and into that coalition. They have a, they're, they're a proper voting block and they can suddenly make decisions Correct. even though they are the lesser within that coalition because they will have pulled. They will have said, we've enabled you. To become the king sure, still sure so that's where we kind of find ourselves now we find ourselves in a space to say if da and anc do decide to be together there's their manifestos are so stark there's a stark difference between their manifestos how they see things da wants less government involvement they want certain type they want less intervention in markets they want free markets yes right they, they it's neoliberalism mm -hmm. that's what it is yeah it's neoliberalism so when you start to find 
and would you, would and you say it's a Western this? identity as well? Fully Western identity. It's, it's Eurocentric, Eurocentric and Western. And Western. I always say, um, sorry to cut you yeah. there. I always say that. Um, look at any black person around the world, yeah. especially an African one. Yeah. If you marry somebody that is white or outside of your race, you will you, always be whitewashed. You move. It's, it's never the other way you around. Move. You move they don't of, become more African. You move out of your community. More you often. move out of your community. Yes. Because the world is created to Eurocentralize, like make yes. us Eurocentralize. Yeah. You know? No, no, no that's very true. Yeah. And, and, and I guess one of the biggest conversations we've got to have is as well, right, with this conversation, and maybe a lot of people might not like it, we need everyone in government. Like, like what I have enjoyed is that the, the conversation around the government of national unity has suddenly started to sprout up. We need everyone. We do need the DA. We do need the EFF. Mm -hmm. We do need MK. We do need the ANC, right? And we need the PA and other parties. Sure. We do need all of them. Because they represent the identities of all South Africans. 100%. Sure. So then the conversation has got to become, when we get a government of national unity, what is it that we will write down as a path forward for all of us? Because South Africa currently is riderless, right? We don't have a clear, clear, clear direction. There isn't an emotive response or, a, or attachment to South Africa that exists within people. We need to change the schooling and how school indoctrinates young South Africans to being proud South Africans. We need to find a way to do that. We need to make sure that there are flags at every single school, that there's a South Africa day, right? A mm. day that has mm. nothing to mm. do with, that has nothing to do with cultural, right? Or racial or anything. Let's sure. have a South Africa day, sure. right? So these things start to, let's, let's sing the national anthem at every single morning. Correct. Right? So people get in and understand. There's, there's a school that I'm close to uh, where I stay. I always hear them. Vibey, vibey, vibey grade school. They're singing like, but Brenda Farsi and whatnot. And, and I said, oh, that's, that's cool. Until something switched in me, I said, but I, I've never heard the, them sing the, the national anthem. That was quite odd. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is something that's going to be driven from an arts and culture perspective, but also from a governmental perspective, say we want strong unity in South Africans. We need everybody. But also at the same time, we've got to say to ourselves, relative to the people who went to the polls, what, is, what are their wills? Because remember, there's a lot of people who might have voted for the ANC who don't agree with the DA, mm -hmm. but they have no say in whether or not the ANC and the DA um, coalesce. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So what happens there, right? What happens there? So it's, it's, it's very tricky. And that, I guess that's how our, our um, elective system is set up, that you basically give your power to a party that then goes and does the bidding based of what their manifesto is and what they believe is the best way to move forward as South Africans. Or what they believe is the best way to move forward for their stomachs. True. I think South Africa has a... Management problem, not a policy problem. Yeah, yeah. We have a yeah, management problem. Yeah. But what this election has done, and what I've seen to become the narrative, which I somewhat agree with, is that a lot of people have said to themselves, they'll finally be accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, so, that's so telling about yeah. how people have always felt about... Uh, a majority the, the, NC rule. 100%. So yeah. like, they'll finally... Sure. Be accountable. Sure. Because now, when you're in with a couple of people, it's not 100% you. Chief whips in parliament in South Africa have had to do nothing for decades. Yeah, yeah. Like, the, the whole role of a chief whip is to take your position and go whip up votes from other parties. Yeah. Is to go and convince other people in parliament to say, you should vote for us. You should vote for this bill because yeah. it'll do one, two, three, four, five. Then the other person checks you and says, ah, ah, mm -hmm. no, bro, I don't agree with that thing. Then suddenly you've got to have a conversation with somebody else. Maybe you create enough numbers to get the bill to pass, but at least you would have had to consult. This is what was one of the key things. Parliament is also going to be a whole lot more vibrant. Absolutely. There's going to be less backbenchers. Correct. Right? Correct. Because suddenly you're going, to, you're going to have to send your best there. Because it's going to matter what your parliamentarians are doing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a Correct. monthly basis. Correct. Because people will suddenly say, yeah, but you're not doing anything. And we sent you. So bonus so bonus are 2026. Yeah. So bonus. Yeah. So, so, so you start to, to have proper mm -hmm. systems of accountability. 
And that's what people are saying that they want. They, they, a lot of people were actually not saying that they were annoyed with the NC or they're over the NC. And to show you that, take, take some of the, out of the top four parties, you've got the ANC, you leave the DA, you've then got MK, and you've got the EFF. That's all ANC. It's all ANC. Yeah. So, 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 so technically, <coughs> people are saying they're not, they, they, they're not mad at the ANC policies. They just want a different set of people guiding these policies and, yeah. and actually managing and executing on them. Sure, sure, sure. And they want the different ideals that the ANC was founded on, yeah. but along the way were lost, yes. to be brought back into the leadership of the country. Yes. Because MK stands for Radical Economic Transformation, yes. which was an ANC policy. Um, EFF stands for similar values yeah. of blackness and being and, and, and maintaining e- your identity. Viability. It's economic in viability, it's right? In the name. It stands for uh, 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 fighting for the, the general worker, yes. the maid, they yeah. dress up in their overalls, yeah. the person who works at the mines, yeah. which represents a vast majority of South Africans who are in that class yes. and the and the and the, the voter the electorate is saying i want to be represented yes. again still via the anc just in a different vehicle 100 percent. and that's that is something that was quite shocking i think i saw i think it was uh ashraf gada yeah the, the, the journalist he yeah. was like when you add up the anc the mk and eff these guys are still hitting boma 60 something two-thirds majority so 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 technically that supposed what the DA calls the doomsday, yeah. um, the doomsday coalition. I think we're not too far off from these guys saying let's form something, yeah. and that's that's my second thing. Where yeah. it's like the ANC, MK, and EFF could form. I think, but yeah, it's the fact that MK has never said that they are against the ANC. They've said they are against the leadership of the ANC. Correct. They are against Cyril Ramaphosa. They are against the leadership of yes. the ANC. So. Question is, could they, as a supposed outside faction of the ANC, force the ANC to change its leadership and say, Sizoni Niga, Sizoni Bolega Umbuso, yeah. will give you our power for you to still continue to govern, but under these terms? And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge possibility. That's why the DA, as of like when we're recording this, that's why there's already reports that the DA is the first one to call up the ANC because they know that That they've got to put something they've got to put something on the table that the ANC is going to be like ooh double take but then at the end of the day you're going to find that the real sort of conversations from a black majority perspective because a lot of people are saying the black vote has been split I say not necessarily I think it's still the same black vote it's just that the leaders of these three entities that hold a lot of the people's votes need to come together and find a way forward Mm -hmm. and that's why I made this uh, I made a prediction in January this year and I said that if the ANC goes below 50 and it's untenable, their, their situation is untenable, they might consider to let go of Cyril Ramaphosa because he would have lost an election. I said that in January already. And it is possibly a reality that could happen because you've got two people in the other block that say Ramaphosa is not really the guy. We don't see him as the guy. One, because definitely went up after Jacob Zuma. And two, on the other side, Malema also doesn't like how he's doing things and the, the pace at which he's doing things as well. So you've got two out of the three in a supposed block that would form saying, ah, we don't like how you guys have, have a thing in there. Now the question is, does internally the ANC take that type of advice on based of what's been put on the plate, which is to say continuity? You guys will continue to, to, uh, to govern, just not in the way that you've been doing it. And we're here to be the checks and balances sure. of your continued governance. But you have to do one, two, three, four. Yeah. So I don't know. So will they risk the man for the organization Remember to maintain power? Yes. Or do they keep the man yeah. but and maintain hope, power without the black majority? Because that's, that 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 that's what yes, DA is. That's what a, DA is. That is an amazing way to put it. Yes. yes. 100%. That's what they've got to deal with. Yeah. Do they deal with the fact that we go with the black majority... But we change our ways in how we service the black majority and how we enact policies for the, that, that will benefit the black majority, mm-hmm. as we've always said we would, mm-hmm. right? Or do we keep power and become almost vindictive in the way that we do things 
and basically go into coalition with the DA and then literally have this oversight that is necessarily not black. Pretty much. That's, that's the choice that they've got. Yeah. yeah. That's the choice that they've got, right? And remember, it's not only just going to be a national conversation, right? It's going to be a, a conversation across the board. It's going to be a conversation around KZN. It's going to be a conversation around Gauden. It's going to be a conversation around Bumalanga, right? Because I think at the time of, of, of this recording, it was like 49.5 or something. Yeah, like it wasn't yeah. an outright majority. Yeah. So all of these things matter. Also bro. Northern Cape. Yes. Yes. All of these things matter. KZN is, a, is around 45% at the time of this recording. It's ridiculous. And I was, uh, for the MK, by the way. Yeah. And I was counting that a, an ANC DA IFP coalition puts them at 49%. Ooh. Which means 1% they can buy these other parties, yeah, yeah, yeah. like they normally do. Yeah, rats and they'll, mice. Yeah, they'll sp- send money to them, yeah. buy them, right? Once again, do you take, as the ANC, do you go with the MK? And show your constituency, especially in KZN, that, that we can that sort you, things out as black people. That we can sort things out as black people. We can people. sort our problems. We out can as sort our pr- yeah. problems out on our own. Yes. Or do we go to these people who are in the multi-party charter, whom the IFP already people are like, why are you I-I-F-P. doing that? I-I-F-P. People are already like, why are you I-I-F-P. doing that? I-I-F-P. Why are you in bed with the DA and then lead KZN? Yeah. And does KZN remain stable with an ANC DA IFP it partnership? Doesn't. doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. We're going to watch a movie for, for the next for, six months. For the, for, the sanity, for, for the sanity of all things and for, for proper continuity, I believe that these guys have got to find a way, right? And, 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 and I must say this to you. Because the, of the people that control capital in this country, mm. when we do that and we form this coalition, let's say we hopefully form this coalition of the ANC, the MK, and EFF, like a proper, proper coalition that divvies up um, uh, state departments, that divvies up how things work, etc. You suddenly have a lot more centers of power, one. Two, you've got these guys that have got to compete for the country, but also amongst themselves within the coalition, because you can say, but the ANC runs 10 portfolios and not portfolios are not doing well. Mm-hmm. The MK runs another seven portfolios. The EFF runs another three portfolios. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you can look and say, look at the MK run portfolios at national government. Look at the, the, uh, the EFF run ones. Look at the ANC ones. Sure. So suddenly we'll have proper ways of discerning as a band who, who's, who's, working. who's actually working. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Who's, because government will not be constituted by one party. It will be a unity government. Mm, mm, mm. And I've got a crazy thing to say to, to, to say to them that I'm not opposed to them saying we'll throw in one or two DA guys to run um, ministries. Correct. I'm not opposed to that. No. I'm not opposed to that. It's actually a good uh, representation of the electorate. I'm, yes, I'm not opposed to that, yeah. right? Let's say whatever. Let me, I'm just off the top of my head. Um, let's say a tourism portfolio. Give it to the DA, yeah. right? It's one of the key things. It's one of the, it, it links to the Western Cape being one of the Correct. most visited, uh, sure. and Cape Town being one of the most visited places. It's up their alley. Mm-hmm. So why not, give, why not give it to them to show unity? This, it's like, we really have to figure how we unite as South Africans. Yeah. We really have to, because you're right. If, if the ANC becomes selfish in this whole thing around power, because it's clear what the electorate is saying. It's saying we don't trust you as much anymore. But Sanfuna, yeah. Mara, we need you checked. Ooh, if uh, they suddenly go with the other guys that, that the same electorate has never voted for, yeah, yeah, yeah. then they're going to go, ah, oh, I've got another one. Yeah. Give police to the PA. Very vocal I'm about... Not, I'm not mad at that. Very vocal about the fact that I've been in jail. Police. I've done crime. I know what crime constitutes of. Yeah. I know the underground gangs. I yeah. know what they do. I know how they operate. I'm probably your best bet at negotiating with them to piece out the volume. Yeah. You know? So, so, so I'm not... And I'm, also... I'm not opposed to that. This actually. colored representation that has we've been got, lost. We've got to, lost, we've got to, lost, we've got to lost. talk about colored representation. We've right? got to talk about it. Because we, we, we can no longer act as if... Colored people in this country don't exist, nor do they have. They don't have a, an option for a voice sure. at the table. Yeah. What What Gaten has done is to really build a groundswell for the colored vote, and I appreciate that because suddenly, Absolutely. as a block, their cries can be heard, other than them being smaller entities within other parties where their voice will never actually be heard in sure. subcommittees and committees. Sure. 
So now we've got to say to ourselves, I appreciate that. In fact, I don't see a, a problem with Gaten saying the Good Party, uh, the National Coloured Coalition in the Western Cape, and 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 and, and other purely coloured coloured uh, specific demographic parties. Mm -hmm. We come together and we become the, the like what the DA did, right? The Democratic Alliance, <coughs> an alliance between a few parties, many, yeah. a few parties. Uh, I think around 19, 1999 mm. they formed, right? So it's not impossible to do, to create something else because the, think about it. Gaten's already called it the Patriotic Alliance. Sure. So maybe you change a couple of colors, you rebrand the thing, and then we say no, the good. Uh, in the National Colored Coalition and other people have now um, formed, uh, have now fallen into this thing, yeah. and they're all driving this thing. So those are some of the things that I'm, I'm really kind of happy about in terms of this result. What I'm fearful of is how will how will we govern going forward? How will we actually govern? Because you've got to understand patronage in this country and how it flows from the top. The, one of the key things that I've always kind of said to myself, I don't, I don't know how we haven't kind of dealt with, is that one, the EFF, for instance, has not governed a place outright. That's one. It's always and been in a coalition. It's always been in a coalition, and they've, they've been um, an important part of coalitions. Yeah. But they've never been able to build, in reality, a network of... I'd say people who support them, etc. Okay. From a business perspective, yeah. Which is why the funding thing becomes really tricky for a lot of parties, mm -hmm. smaller parties, mm -hmm. because you ask yourself, where does the money come from? Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out political party funding in this country. It's going to be a problem for us going forward if we don't figure it out, because we're then going to start getting nefarious actors that are going to fund political parties because we are not funding them sufficiently. I hear it's you. going to be a problem because when there is a funding gap, people have to fundraise. And when they fundraise, there's only a finite number of people willing to inject money into politics anyways. And when nefarious actors see the opportunity to fund politics, you're then going to be, we're, go we're all going to be in a hot, hot bother. The MK keeps on emphasizing that um, they are funded by the people. Um, if you go according to the numbers that they keep on giving us, they say that <clears throat> within a few hours of opening their website, yeah. they were able to register a million members. Yeah. That's why their website crashed. Yeah. And in registering, registering a million members, the joining fee was 50 rand. Yeah. Would you say that's the way to go? Crowdfunding, basically. So, so it's part of, I think as part of a, a larger pie, that is how political parties should be funded. Yes. Yeah. You should get from your constituencies. The other thing that becomes tricky around politics, specifically in South Africa, right, is, is purse strings, government purse strings. Because the conversation is always certain people will get government tenders and then they will uh, offer patronage, financial patronage, to said political parties that, that might be there, have facilitated, etc. What that starts to do is and it starts to create a thing of type of thing. Mm. And we've got to do... It's, We've got to do away with it. And I think one of the ways that we do that is that we've got to be clear about how political funding, political party funding has got to move forward. I don't have a solution for you right now, but I can tell you that there's a problem. And I don't like only talking about problems, but I think about it and I say, what's, what's the difference? Do we then maybe increase and say, okay, you declare anything over 50 million? Because... Look, as much as Raisin Zanzi was in a spot of bother around political party funding, there was also another issue, which was... Yeah, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you think about it, that doesn't cover even, like, a whole poster situation Correct. For, around the country. Mm -hmm. 15 million small in political mm -hmm. party things. There have been numbers around half a billion to a billion. But we've never seen them on paper. Exactly. <clears throat> so now you've got to ask yourself and say, if we don't, all as South Africans... Start to understand that politics needs money. How do we create the conditions for clean money to go sure. into politics? Because if we don't do that, we open the door for dirty money to find its way into politics. 
And dirty money is the reason crime perpetuates. 100%. Is the reason people don't get jailed. Is the reason drugs and counterfeit goods come into the yeah. country. Because and uh, human trafficking continues. Yeah. And organ because trafficking. where the hell does that money come from? Because where the hell does the money come from? Yes. That's why you hear that a political party can't pay its staff members and within two days the money appears out of nowhere. Mm. So, so the other thing I think we've got to have a conversation about is turnout in this election. Turnout has... They're saying that the turnout will probably land between 58 Eight. and yeah. 59. Probably, because we're almost done. 58, 59. That's terrible. The it last is. turnout was 66%. Yeah. So now the, the question then becomes the legitimacy of election results starts to be in question in itself because not enough people participated in the process. Mm -hmm. Yes, those people should have participated so that their voice could be heard. But what if they don't, guys? What if they don't? What if only 58% of the people, of the 27 million people that were registered, showed up on the day and actually voted? That's a small portion. Sure. So suddenly the democratic right to rule of those who win the elections under these circumstances starts to come into question. Mm, 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 and that's yeah. something we need to have a conversation about. Then do, do, do we find easier ways and multiple ways for people to vote? I don't know. Do we, do, so, so we've got to figure things out a bit. Even when, even when you look at the process of how it went this last time, there's a lot of eyes on the IEC and how they did things. Sure. There's a lot of questions that the IEC has got to answer, right? From on the day to after the day to counting to discrepancies in counting to data capture to reporting to websites going down. There's so much that they've got to answer for. And, 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 and they came out, and I've been listening to a lot of the interviews. They came out and said, no, look, it wasn't the money. Yes, their budget's been cut. But we've got to look at, is it a budget cut situation that has caused this particular thing to not be efficient and effective? Or is it ineptitude and just gross neglect of how things are meant to go? Is it, is it gross inefficiency? What if the gross if inefficiency has always been there, but for the first time, <clears throat> social media, digital media, yeah. new media yeah. has made every single electorate member, which is every single South African who voted, yeah. is now a journalist. And they can report yeah. on what is happening on the ground. So before this, a few, five, ten years ago, yeah. two elections ago, yeah. not every South African or majority of the South Africans can walk in with their smartphone and take a picture of what they voted for Ooh. and then log in to the results website quickly to, quickly to check if my vote was captured. Yeah. So, so that, is, that is a very interesting case. And I saw a lot of those last <clears throat> night. Um, a lot of people started to do it for themselves. And, yeah. um, there's, a, there's a colored gentleman called Darren. I can't yes, think, yeah, TikTok. Darren, yes, on TikTok. Yeah. So Darren has been doing and running a campaign where he says, guys, we need to fact check the, the IEC. Mm -hmm. and now, a lot of people are saying, no, uh, he's causing a storm in a teacup. Yeah, he's causing yeah. fear, -mongering. fear mongering, angst amongst people, etc." I'm like, we should double check mm -hmm. things. There are a couple of really brazen things that I've seen on social media that are not verified um, by the time we're having this conversation. And they will be verified. And IEC needs to have those conversations around what those things are. But if we can't trust the process as it is now mostly paper-based, then maybe we should start to input a lot of digitization into it and more checks and balances in order for us to feel comfortable. Because human error and human nature mm -hmm. are two crazy things. Mm -hmm. Because you suddenly start to find that if somebody decides, I want to add another number on that thing, I want to add a one in, in, in front of that five, 569. Suddenly it's 1,569. That's a huge implication. Because remember, when the voter turnout is low, you go, oh, no, man, like, there's still buffer. Oh, maybe more people just happen to vote at the station. Mm, 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 you don't... Mm. You don't pick it up. You don't pick it up. Yes, it's like, yeah. but if... So suddenly, you, you can't go over 100% in terms of voting. But, but if you know that at the station... Ah, we still had a buffer of two, three thousand votes mm -hmm, of people mm -hmm. who didn't come to mm -hmm. vote. I can add a thousand. No one's going to ask questions. But the system shouldn't allow for that. Sure. So we've got to say to ourselves, how do we digitize? And the, the digitization process 
we already put money on our phones. Our cards are on our phones. Mm-hmm. They're on our watches. So if we're going to move in a digitized manner, it might not be us. Or it might be the tail end of us, right? Us as millennials. Maybe all the guys it's not. Maybe you give people the opportunity to say, you can go to a voting station and still vote normally. But there will be pre-verification and voting centers across more multiple places where you can come in and verify beyond a shadow of a doubt. And we'll use AI to verify that it is you. We'll use biometrics to verify that it is you. Imagine you could vote at any place that is home affairs. Any place. It'll be open on, the, on voting day. Because but we're using biometrics. Because they all have our biometrics. I, I can go in and vote anyway. Right. On the day. Yeah. In fact, we then start there where it's still physically me going. But I get there. I've got my ID. I show my thing. I scan my thing. They already use this when you travel the world. Sure. You already just get there. You scan your passport. You move on. You scan your ID. You stand in front of the thing. It scans your face. And you, it says, here are your options. What do you want? Then you, you do your thing. Even on paper... You slot it into a machine that counts it immediately. When it comes out, you check: is it my vote? Is it is, is my vote correct? Yes, it is. Boom. And next next ballot. Boom. Yes, enter. Next ballot. Boom. It's counted. Then you take still. You fold the thing. Put it in the box. Put it in the box. Still. As a backup plan. But sudden, that's what America does, right? Yeah. America, yeah. their voting system works in this way that I vote, <clears throat> it gets put into a machine that counts it immediately. Immediately. Whoop. Counted immediately. Then they still have the backup of the paper. So we will not take away that system. We're just saying, democratize where people can vote. Make voting, by its pure nature, two days. Because you've already taken like X amount of days. Because make it two days of voting. Open it up to everybody. So maybe I didn't go today. I can still go tomorrow. Go to this thing where it's a digital portal that's placed there. It's got verification, whatnot. I get there, I verify my, my identification. It's at a bank. Yes, it is this person. He goes there. What is your voting thing? It's got a little voting machine that prints out your slip. You put it in there. I vote for this party, this party. It, it shows you on the screen. You confirm, you say, yes, yes. You put it into your thing. We've got to democratize the process of voting so that more people can vote, so that the legitimacy of those who get put into power can stand. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. It, 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 actually, it actually makes a lot of sense. Bro, where, where to from now? I think... I where, think where are we headed? That's a great Should question. we be scared? Should we be I, worried? I think, I think fear, Should we be happy that we, 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 we finally eliminated people who have disappointed I, us for so long? Account, the lack of accountability. Yeah. I, I still believe that the ANC is needed. I still believe that MK is needed. I still believe that DA is needed, PA is needed, EFF is needed. We need everyone, guys. This thing of, yes, your vote is important to vote for the block of people that have a particular manifesto that resonates with you. But we should still have a common goal and a vision to move South Africa forward. Sure. And where this lies and where I've found and figured that the least amount of conversation around this election um, has not been is the economy. And that's one of the things that I am a true supporter of, so the social economics, right? We, as South Africa, can only get out of this quagmire that we find ourselves in, where we've got unemployment, poverty, etc. We can only get out of this thing if we trade our way out of it. Mm-hmm. If we create goods that we sell to the rest of the world, mm-hmm. there's no other way to get out of this. Correct. And we are not having that conversation. We're not, it's the one conversation that we're not having. Guys, we've got to fix Transnet. We've got to get rail going. We've got to say to Transnet, we're going to give you an extra X amount of billions and we're going to put four to five ships that are Transnet owned that are going to be seafaring ships. So when it starts, we, we get it from the mine, we move it on Transnet, we build small hubs that can start to manufacture things or treat whatever raw materials we have, so create steel, put it on rail, put it on our ships, take it to other countries. Suddenly, you start to have a little bit more money coming into the country. We've got to connect our rail networks and our economic ties to the SADC area. SADC has about 250 million plus people. SADC, SADC, Mm. SADC. That's all the countries that are within the SADC region going up to Zambia, DRC, etc. 
we've got to start creating common economic ties between ourselves as countries in the SADC bloc so that we are interdependent. Zimbabwe, we've got to start putting up proper barriers to Zimbabwe so that we can start to figure out what is happening in South Africa, one. Two, we've got to help Zimbabwe Mm -hmm. because it will be our problem. If your neighbors are starving, your cabbages will start going missing. America, Mexico. Yes. Yeah. They they had to help Mexico. And Mm -hmm. Mexico is a trillion plus dollar economy, right? Yeah. They're now becoming the China of America. They're the ones creating, right? Yeah. So we've got to say to ourselves, the economics of South Africa have got to change. But they don't change without us making the pie bigger. But we don't make the pie bigger by creating the same things. We are passing 100 rand around each other in this country. I give you 100 rand for your water. You give 100 rand for the bottle. Take the same 100 rand to somebody else. for. It doesn't grow. Mm, mm. We've got to get somebody else from outside of this household coming in and saying, I'll give you 120 rand for that water. And we say, perfect, let's produce more water and sell it to this guy. Suddenly, we've created that 20 rand. More money is flowing into South Africa. Sure. We've got to get money flowing in. But we've also got to create the conditions for us to be stable enough from a governance perspective where we can say to ourselves, do we reward and create the conditions for people to be economically active as small business players. Small businesses that employ 0 to 15 people are the backbone of any economy globally. We need more of those businesses. We're hoping those businesses grow to be 50 plus people, 200 people, 300 people, 1,000 people employee businesses. But the reality is that those 0 to 15 employee businesses are the businesses that run and keep our economy growing, right? We've got to nurture those. So we've got to decrease taxes for those business owners that do these things. We've got to then incentivize South Africans to create products to sell overseas. Yeah. We've got to say, Yazin, if you are exporter products, if we export exporter more products and you do this thing for export, your tax will be lower because you're bringing in dollars that can offset us not taking more tax from you. Hmm. We've got to start thinking a little bit more, more with more agility. Sure. We've got to say to ourselves, we are going to go into a sovereign wealth fund, one of the first of its kind in the world, where we're going to say to asset managers in South Africa, a portion of the money that you make and have in assets, we are going to pull it together. The state is going to take from revenues that come from oil and gas, which is a big thing that we need to have a discussion about in this country, from mining and all of the primary industries that we have in South Africa. We're going to take that money, the royalties, we're going to put a portion of it into a sovereign wealth fund and we're going to build it for the next 50 years. But you, private sector, will have an opportunity to technically run this for us. But with oversight coming from either PIC structures um, or or other government structures, where we say, we want you to go out into the world and trade South Africa's money. By the way, we already do this. We already do this. Yeah, yeah. This is not something new. The PIC, the Public Investment Corporation, already... It's trading our money. They already take a portion of our money and give it (laughs) to wealth and asset managers already. We are doing this. We're not reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all of the trillions of of rands that sit in trusts in South Africa, under assets, under management, etc., we've got to get that money to start working for the country. We've got to say to ourselves... How do we create more money coming from outside in? We've got to trade. We've got to go out there and invest into the rest of the world. And we've got to say to ourselves, we're doing this together with public and private. We've got to, and here, this thing, this is one of the things that Tabo Mbeki has spoken about quite a lot. The social compact that, that South Africa is missing is what we need to fix. And what that means is that the glue that binds us together. So it starts with, if we have this government unity, if we have this business unity, mm-hmm. We start to have a social compact that is underpinned by the things that exist in this country. And one last thing. I had a conversation with a guy in Davos. A a white guy who's married to a a white woman, Afrikaner woman from South Africa. German guy. He's into solar and all of these other things. He He asked me what I think could change the feeling and perception that black people have towards what white people did to black people in South Africa during apartheid. And I immediately, without even thinking it, I said, white people need to take money, put it into a fund, make all education free in South Africa. 
They can do that. They have the money. Build a fund, 100 billion rand fund, mm-hmm. to make schooling in South Africa free. Make varsity schooling free. Mm. Free. Free. And I don't mean like you make it completely free, my brother. They can do that. What that will do, it will make about what happened. Because now the government starts to raise your kids and put them through a system. When we get to metric and you finish your metric, whether you want to study engineering, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a scientist, you want to be whatever, an accountant, it's free in South Africa. Because white people, as they are reparations for what happened in South Africa, will have built an education fund that will last the next 300 years. Then suddenly Umdom Yama can say, they have started to fix it. Yeah. Suddenly, you're, you as a black parent, don't worry. The government takes care of my kids from early childhood development all the way to matric. Then after that, the white people, for what happened in the past, and they may not be the ones who did it, but they benefited from it, they will suddenly say, we have created a free education fund For all, for black, white, Indian, colored, whoever, you will all get free schooling from a joint solidarity fund, education fund that covers Bonga Bandana Basa South Africa. As long as you qualify. As long as you've qualified free education in South Africa, free. You then relieve those funds from government. And then government can repurpose those funds into something else. That government, this new government of, of national unity. That is how white people can start to fix a lot of what happened. Start to yeah, fix. Yeah. <laughs> My brother, as you said, we could go on forever. <clears throat> but I think we've, we've, we've touched on, on the government of national unity. Yeah. We've touched on... The economics. The economics behind it. We've touched on the possible solutions. Yeah. We've touched on the different uh, uh, coalitions. coalitions that yeah. are possible and what do they mean for the country and what they could possibly mean for us moving forward. So I, I think we've done our bit. We, in, we've in done our bit to, to give people yeah. a rounded approach about sure. where we should be going as a country. Sure. And, and, and I appreciate platforms like this because yeah. it's, these are the platforms that will shape young minds, minds our age, and some of the older people to start seeing that we're not just a lost youth. Mm. We're a youth that doesn't have the capital to change things. Mm-hmm. We've got the ideas. Our yeah. ideas... There are a plenty. There are it's, a bucket of plenty. But Asinai Mali, your chica is into currently. And we need to have a conversation about how do we truly, truly, truly come together as South Africans? Because we need everyone. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you, bro. Thanks, bro. <laughs>